Hello, and thanks to CIS for organising this day and also for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, what I'm focusing on is both the links between the sexual exploitation of children and women and the ways in which I think because of um, policy and legal changes in recent years, we've moved away from recogni recognising those links to a large extent and the importance of um, coming back to, look to, to looking at the links and looking at ju not just the links between the ways in which children and especially girls and women are exploited in the sex trade, but also how challenges to the sex trade need to take into account both aspects, both the ex exploitation of children and the exploitation of women. So, in recent years, the use of language explicitly associated with prostitution has been removed from legislation, quite deliberately removed from legislation, relating to the sexual exploitation of children, and it's also been removed largely from national and policy documents. There's been a reframing of the sexual exploitation of children, largely driven by national charities working with sexually exploited children at a local level. And they've argued that the use of language related to prostitution in relation to children hinders recognition of the sexual exploitation of children as a form of child sexual abuse, because it creates a perception, at least in some people, that the children involved are consenting. Um, in common with other feminist researchers such as Margaret Melrose and Maddie Coy, I'd argue that this reframing is helping to obscure the fact that the commercial sexual exploitation of children is an integral part of the wider sex trade and can't be separated from it. Melrose has suggested that the eradication of language related to prostitution limits our understanding of prostitution as an institution rooted in structural social inequalities of sex, age, social class and race, and that that in turn limits our understanding of the ways in which prostitution as an institution exploits children and young people. And I think we need to keep hold of the idea that it's a social institution, it's, it's a trade, it's an abusive trade. And when we talk about prostitution, we're talking about that trade. We're not talking about individuals. For example, I'm not advocating a return to the use of terms like child prostitute. I don't call adult women prostitutes. I don't call anybody a prostitute. I would say a child abused in prostitution or a child who's being sexually exploited or a sexually exploited woman or a prostituted woman. I don't, wouldn't call anyone a prostitute. I'm not advocating a return to that language, but what I am questioning is the way in which we've separated off our understandings of the sexual exploitation of children and of adults to such an extent that I think it's actually detrimental to our ability to challenge both forms of exploitation. Coy, Maddie Coy has argued that the decoupling of the prostitution of children and of adults has made the role of men who pay for sexual access to children invisible in much policy and much thinking. And it's certainly invisible in national policy documents relating to child sexual exploitation. You can't find a reference to anybody paying for sexual access to a child in those documents. That the, the fact that men are paying for sexual access to children has somehow been obscured by the way in which we're using language now. And also I think the language of current policy is making invisible the commercial nexus between men who pay essentially to sexually abuse children and the third party profiteers or pimps who provide those men in most cases with the children that they abuse. So both groups of perpetrators are being made invisible, I think, by the way in which we're using language. And not just the way in which we're using language, because the term child sexual exploitation may be very clear to all of us, but I don't think it's clear to people who don't work in this field. Whereas the older language, which used phrases like children abused in prostitution, was much more easily understood to the general public, I think. Um, the sex trade is a global system in which women and children and some men are bought and sold as sexual commodities for the sexual pleasure of men who pay for sexual access to other people's bodies and for the enrichment of third party profiteers, pimps, who in most cases provide those men with the women and children they abuse. Coercion and exploitation of vulnerabilities created by structural inequalities, 
of sex, class, race and age, as I've already mentioned, are the foundations on which the sex trade is built. And I think law and policy, which tries to respond to the sex trade as if it operated in neatly separated segments of coerced and non-coerced, that's already been mentioned by other speakers today, and the separate exploitation of adults and children fails to understand the nature of the trade, in which the different segments are deeply interconnected. We need to recognise the different patterns of exploitation within the trade in order to combat them, but I think we also need to recognise the deep connections between them and develop strategies for combating the trade as a whole. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pimping and third or third party profiteering, all of which I think is essentially pimping within the trade. And my definition of what pimping is is taken from the definition of trafficking in persons in the um, it's got a very long name, the United Nations Protocol to Prevent, Suppress and Punish Trafficking in Persons, especially women and children, commonly known as the UN Palermo Protocol. It defines trafficking in persons, it refers to recruitment and transportation, but I'm focusing on the means, which is the threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power, or of a position of vulnerability or the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of the person having, having a control over another person for the purposes of exploitation. That really describes not only transnational trafficking, as is commonly understood, it really describes pimping in all its many forms. The different strategies that are used, threats, force, abduction in some cases, deception, and so on. And pimping operates on a continuum from boyfriends who are also pimps on the one hand to local and national organized uh, pimping networks to transnational trafficking. What we all have in common is the use of coercion and manipulation of both adult women and sometimes men and children into the sex trade. And the strategies that are identified in the Palermo Protocol are endemic to the sex trade. The sex trade couldn't exist without high levels of coercion and manipulation and exploitation of existing vulnerability because most the children in it and the majority of women exploited in the trade would not be there if they had any real choice about it. Therefore, the only way to meet the demand of some men for sexual access to other people's bodies that they wish to pay for is coercion and pimping and exploitation of pre-existing vulnerabilities. Without that coercion, without the strategies described in the Palermo Protocol, the sex trade would collapse. It would not exist, certainly not in its current form. The connections between the sexual exploitation of children and adult women are very clear to see in many respects. Often the same pimps and traffickers, certainly the same strategies of pimping and trafficking are involved in relation to both children and adults, but also sometimes the same pimps. Girls and women are trafficked across national borders by the same traffickers and often taken to the same sex markets. Uh, Kelly, in a study in, published in 2002, estimated that 10 to 30 percent of trafficked females worldwide are minors. Um, many of the pimps who exploited young women in the Rotherham and Newcastle grooming gangs, as they were called, also controlled adult prostitution, which is a fact that's not widely known or commented upon. And there were um, some prosecutions in Newcastle in 2017 of a group of men and one woman who were sexually exploiting young women. But what was not so highlighted in the media that some of the women that they sexually exploited were aged up to 25. So they were exploiting women and girls aged between 13 and 25 and coercing them into sleeping with men for money which was handed over to the network. Um, research suggests that targeting minors is a common strategy of pimps. Um, that's because young women and children are easier to manipulate and control, generally, than adults. 
but also because pimps are very aware that many men who wish to purchase sexual access prefer younger women and often prefer children. So going on to talking about buyers, Julia O'Connell Davidson in her study of children in global sex markets, it was an international study, suggested that attempts to draw a firm boundary between the prostitution of, adu of adults and children does not reflect the realities of sex commerce. She states that children and adults often serve the same clients. It's a horrible term, but it's reality. Because what is happening is not somebody buying sex, what is happening is somebody buying a service from another person. It's not an equal relationship. And similarly, Monzini, who also carried out research, um, found that adult women and underage girls were often considered to be interchangeable goods within the sex trade, both by pimps and by buyers. Coya suggested that in commercial sex markets, youth is eroticized and prized, and young women are sexualized as premium commodities, which should come as no surprise, because that's not just the case in the sex trade. Young women are sexualized in, within the whole culture now, increasingly. And a lot of the talks that have been given earlier today highlight that. Also, people have referred to the fact that many women who are exploited in the sex trade entered the trade as children. Farley et al. interviewed 854 women in prostitution across nine countries in research that was published in 2003, and 47% of them had entered the trade before the age of 18. The International Office for Migration published some research in 2009 of 271 trafficked women and girls who'd been assisted by NGOs in Kosovo in one year. The majority of them were minors. 32% were aged between 11 and 14, and 49% were aged between 15 and 18. Now, they probably represented only a small proportion of the, the girls and women who were trafficked in Kosovo at that time because only a minority probably would be assisted by NGOs or come to the attention of NGOs. The most recent statistics relating to the UK national referral mechanism to which um, people are referred to are thought to be, have been trafficked across borders into the UK but also UK nationals or U and UK residents are also referred if they're thought to come within the definitions of the Modern Slavery Act so uh, young women and adults as well who've been internally trafficked within the UK can be referred to the mechanism and the most recent statistics su suggest that 31% of the females referred were as sexually exploited were minors and 53% of the males referred as sexually exploited were minors. The other people who are trafficked uh, or exploited for labour exploitation are also referred to the mechanism, but those figures focus specifically on sexual exploitation. I'll go back. In addition to these connections um, between the, the prostitution of adults or the sexual exploitation of adults and children, I think that there's a very deep level of connection, which is not simply about um, more practical issues. It's about the fact that if adults can be sexually commodified, and if it's seen as legitimate or it's seen as inevitable, that men can buy sexual access to the bodies of adult women or indeed adult males, then inevitably, some men at least, will see it as acceptable that they can buy sexual access to the bodies of children. If you sexually commodify one group of human beings, then you make it more acceptable to sexually commodify other human beings, including children. So I think that the commercial sexual exploitation of children can only be effectively challenged by policy and law that recognises this and which is focused on reducing demand for sexual exploitation in all its forms. But since the late 1990s and early 2000s, and continuing on until now, the commercial sex sexual exploitation of adults and children has gradually been placed 
in separate silos or separate categories in law and policy in many respects. And I'll briefly talk about how this happened. This has happened be, uh, with very good intentions. And I, I want to acknowledge that. I don't mean to criticise any of the people who've argued against the use of the uh, terminology of prostitution in relation to children and young people. I think they were very well intentioned. But I also think that what has happened has created unintended consequences, which make it more difficult to challenge the trade. Um, historically, operational policing of uh, prostitution has tended to focus on street prostitution, um, both because it's highly visible in the neighbourhoods in which it takes place. That's one reason. And so it's publicly visible. It's easy for the police to arrest uh, women, and they used to also arrest children for soliciting, and that's, that's an issue that was talked about earlier, the fact that women retain those um, criminal convictions for having been arrested for soliciting. It was very common at one time for the police to arrest children for soliciting on the street, even if they were under 16. And even though children under 16 cannot consent to sex in law, at one time they were arrested and prosecuted for soliciting on the streets. And that approach was challenged by national charities working with young people who were being sexually exploited. At the time, that was mainly Bernardo's, who were still very active in this area, and the Children's Society. And they argued that children in the sex trade should be responded to as children who were being sexually abused and not as criminals. And largely in response to their campaigning work, the government published guidance for the first time about what they described as children involved in prostitution. That was in 2000. And around about the same time, Bernardo's developed a definition of what they called children abuse through prostitution, which they described as any involvement of a child or young person below 18 in sexual activity for which a remuneration of cash or in kind is given to the child or young person or a third person or persons. The perpetrator will have power over the child by virtue of one or more of the following, age, emotional maturity, gender, physical strength, and intellect. I think this was a very good definition because it clearly identified the commercial exchange which takes place between the men buying sexual access to children and the pimps who are controlling those children. It identified the person paying for sexual access as a perpetrator of child sexual abuse, but at the same time, it acknowledged that what was happening was part of the wider institution of prostitution or commercialised um, sexual exchange. So it identified both sets of perpetrators, men who buy sexual access to children and pimps who control the children um, that they buy. But then Melrose, who's done a study of the history of this, notes that the term children abuse through prostitution was abandoned as the campaign to distinguish between the involvement of children and adults in the sex trade um, developed. And the idea developed that no terminology relating to prostitution should be used in relation to children because um, the children were, would be stigmatized if that language was used to describe them. So the term children abuse through prostitution was dropped and the term commercial sex sexual exploitation was introduced. Then the word commercial was dropped. So there was nothing in the definition to say any money was changing hands. Um, and in 2009, new government guidance used the term sexual exploitation. It de-emphasized the commercial exchange involved and arguably, I think it's led to a blurring of the distinction between what is now called child sexual exploitation and other forms of child sexual abuse. The distinguishing, the main difference between the two is money. All sexual activity that, that, that an adult enacts on a child is child sexual abuse. But within the sex trade, they pay to do it. And usually they pay another adult to do it, a pimp. Not always, but usually. There's some evidence that the vagueness of the term child sexual exploitation is causing confusion amongst practitioners. Melrose did a study in 2013 with local child safeguarding boards, and she said the concept had become so elastic as to be meaningless. 
And she thought it was giving rise to more confusion than clarity amongst both practitioners and policymakers at a local level who are responding to the sexual exploitation of children. The government has also shown some confusion about the term. In February 2016, it launched a consultation on the development of a new statutory definition of child sexual exploitation, which is now come into being, and it's actually on the CIS website if anybody wants to look at it. The consultation acknowledged that two different definitions of child sexual exploitation had been published in different government documents and were being used by practitioners. And they also said that some agencies used the terms child sexual abuse and child sexual exploitation interchangeably, and that was using to what they called inconsistencies in risk assessment. Now, social workers and other agencies who work in child safeguarding assess risk in order to develop strategies and plans for safeguarding children from those risks. So inaccurate risk assessments can lead to inappropriate child safeguarding interventions, and that can have serious negative consequences for children, whether they're children who are exploited within the sex trade or children who are being sexually abused in other ways. So I think it's important that we use language accurately in this context, not just because it's a matter of theoretical accuracy, but because it has real effects on the lives of children and young people if we don't use language accurately and if child um, safeguarding professionals don't actually understand the nature of what they're dealing with. The confusion which the decoupling of child and adult commercial sexual exploitation in policy can create is illustrated by some of the changes Bernardo's brought about with their terminology in the early 2000s. Now, I'm not attacking Bernardo's. I think they've been pioneers in challenging punitive attitudes towards children who've been sexually exploited. And they've done very good work in supporting children. But I think some of their policy in, in relation to the use of language um, has had some negative consequences. So this was how they changed their terminology. In the 1990s, they described what was happening to the young women they were working with at local level as a prostitution triangle involving what they called a young prostitute, which is not a term that anyone would use now, a pimp and a punter. Now, if they had said prostituted young person or prostituted child, that would have expressed what they were trying to talk about more clearly. But the first triangle, the prostitution triangle, did make clear in what way the young person was being exploited and who the different sets of perpetrators were who were exploiting her and involved in her abuse. They changed that because they wanted to remove any terminology which was linked to prostitution in people's minds to an abuse triangle in which, so they talked about an abused child, an abusive adult, and a child sex offender. What's the difference between an abusive adult and a child sex offender? How can we tell who is who in that second triangle? Now, as I said, it was well-intentioned, but I think what it has done has caused confusion. Now, the reason why Bernardo's changed the model is because they thought that language associated with prostitution um, encouraged stigmatisation of young people because of people's attitudes to prostitution and the way in which they do stigmatise and stereotype both children and adults who are sexually exploited. I don't think that was the best way to challenge that. Um, and that idea um, was expressed in the passage of the Serious Crime Act in 2015. It's now legislation. And during the passage of the legislation, Anne Coffey, MP, who put forward amendments to remove all references to child prostitution from legislation, argued that the term child prostitute implies an element of complicity and gives the idea of a consensual contract of a child offering sex in return for gifts or money. There's been a significant cultural shift away from talking about child prostitution to talking about child exploitation. Underlying that change is the acknowledgement that a child cannot consent to exchanging sex for financial gain. Um, and that attitude that... Um, 
sexual exploitation where it doesn't involve a child and doesn't involve an adult, an adult who is, can be proven to be subjected to force is the underlying thinking behind current law in England and Wales. It criminalises paying for the sexual services of a child and it criminalises paying, criminalises paying for the sexual services of an adult subjected to force. But it doesn't criminalise paying for sexual services in any other circumstances. Sexual services is the terminology used in the legislation. Now, um, that approach, I think, is based on the idea that the majority of the interactions that happen within the sex trade are consensual and are based on non-abusive consensual contracts, except where they involve a child or an adult who is clearly trafficked or pimped. But most of the research suggests that that is not the reality of the sex trade. All sorts of, of um, vulnerabilities and inequalities are being exploited by the sex trade. The levels of coercion going on within the sex trade are very widespread. Some are much more subtle than others and not so easy to see. It'd be, it's very difficult to prove that a woman, an adult woman or a man is subjected to force in many circumstances. And so there are numerous adults involved in the sex trade who are being pimped, who are not necessarily being protected by this legislation, but also the legislation does not recognise the inherently abusive nature of the trade. Um, the only legal model which does, which has already been talked about, is the Nordic model which decriminalises prostituted people, does not prosecute people for soliciting or any other, any other activity associated with being prostituted. It criminalises those who pay for sexual access to others and it criminalises third party profiteering, which is the case in this jurisdiction. It, third party profiteering of any kind is criminalised. But the buying of sexual services, except in particular circumstances, is not. Um, now, the Nordic model was in effect put into practice in Ipswich in 20, in, um, starting in 2006 following the murders of five prostituted women, which um, I have, somebody referred to earlier, I can't remember now. It implemented the principles of the Nordic model as far as it could within the current law. And its aim was to deter the buying of sexual access to others provide routes out of prostitution and prevent the entry into prostitution of children and young people in particular. It identified and supported 400 children who were at risk of sexual exploitation over a six year period. And that was facilitated by an understanding that the prostitution of adults and children is part of the same exploitative trade. Now, most Nordic model advocates are aware of the Ipswich project and its success in assisting adult women to leave prostitution um, and making really significant changes in Ipswich during the period in which it was in, in operation. Its success in preventing child sexual exploitation is less well known and it certainly doesn't seem to be well known by um, organisations who lobby on behalf of sexually exploited children. So I think if, if those two sets of lobbying groups, Nordic model advocates and organisations working on behalf of sexually exploited children could come together and discuss ways of working together to implement the Nordic model, that would be the most one of the effective ways of challenging sexual exploitation in both instances, adults and children. And this has already happened in Ireland. Um, in the run-up to what became the Sexual um, Offences Act to 2017 in Ireland, which in the Republic of Ireland, which introduced the Nordic model, children's charities, including Bernardo's Island, Island, were part of a campaign called Turn Off the Red Light. And there was, no, there was an organisation called the Children's Rights Alliance who were involved in that campaign. There were a network of over 100 children's charities, and they supported the campaign for the Nordic model in Ireland. And this is a quotation from the woman who led... Um, who leads, still leads the Children's Rights Alliance. I won't read all of it, but I think the important part of this is, is she says, we signed up to bring a specific child focus to the campaign. 
we were and still are deeply concerned about the exploitation of children and young people in Ireland's sex industry. We also believe that the most effective way to tackle this exploitation is to place a criminal onus on the purchasers of sex. Although strong legislation exists to prosecute child abusers, the demand for child prostitution still leaves vulnerable children at serious risk. Um, if you want to know more about that, Turn Off the Red Lights will have a website where you can find information about the campaign. Now, in this jurisdiction, um, the women's sector working around domestic abuse and the children's sector have often worked together very effectively in challenging domestic abuse, based on a recognition of the interconnections between the abuses of women and the abuses of children that take place in, in situations of coercive control in a domestic situation. If th those two groups feminist activists and organisations working on behalf of children, especially sexually exploited children, could also come together, recognise the common connections between what it is that we're trying to combat. I think that, that could form a very powerful lobbying group to try to get the Nordic model enacted in England and Wales. Thank you.